Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the La Lido Loca Cruise Podcast. I am your host, Tony, and we've got a really great episode for you today. We're going to be talking a lot about Carnival's newest cruise ship, the Carnival Jubilee. Going to be talking to a longtime cruiser, 19 years cruising, a platinum cruiser on both Carnival and on Princess, and a big-time casino gambler. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about the Jubilee. We're going to talk about Texas. We're going to talk about what it takes to get a free cruise gambling. Uh, it's my friend and neighbor here in Spring Hill, Florida, Mike Gormley, also known as the Naughty Cruiser. Uh, yeah, so excited to talk to this guy. Um, yeah, here you go. Let's talk some cruising. So, um, I'm, you know, I, I want to know what your origin story is. How did you get into cruising? And, um, you know, how, how's it? Because is it your life obsession? But, or, or how'd you get into it? So, I'm one of seven, right? So, when you're a kid and you're one of seven, your family trips were like frugal, friendly trips. Cruising was never a thing until uh, my siblings got older and they got pushed out of the picture with family trips a little more. And then my parents decided one year they were going to go on a cruise with my grandparents. And it was just an all adults cruise. They went, they had a good time. And then the following year, we decided to do like this big family trip and we all went. And uh, my first cruise was on the, the Golden Princess. I had to look it up today and I was like, man, that was, it was in 2004. I was 15 years old. And I didn't Golden even think Princess. the ship was still in the fleet with Princess. And it's not because in 22, it was transferred over to P&O. So it's now part of the P&O fleet. But that was my first cruise was on the Golden Princess. You started with Princess at 15 years old. And gosh, how many years ago is that? That's 19 years this year? 19 years, yeah. Wow. And so did you cruise frequently after that? Or was there a gap it was every in there? Year. It was every year. Every year. Every year we went on a trip. Um, up until I was about 18, we used to do a, a, an alternating year. So we would go one year as a family and then the parents would go the following year and then vice versa. And then once I got older, I was able to like pick what I wanted for Christmas. And it was always, yeah, I want to go on a cruise. I don't want nothing uh -huh. under the tree. I don't want no cash. Book me a cruise. I'm happy with that. So we started going every year. And then when I got to that age where I could go by myself, I started going as often as I could. So how many, how many I, cruises total do you feel like you've been on at this point? Or do you, so do you right now, yeah, according to shipmate, I've been on 36. Nice. Now, there's a couple in there that I can guarantee you didn't make it into the shipmate. But yeah. I'm elite with Princess, and I'm platinum with Carnival. I've been on Norwegian. I've been on Margaritaville. So I've I've spread the love seed to all, all the cruise lines that I could so <laughs> far. And now with living in Florida, man, it's it's so easy to hop on a cruise ship here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Margar we were on that same Margaritaville at Sea Cruise yeah. together, of course. and. That that one's not shipmate. So every time I do a count, I'm like, oh, I got to add one more because I, I don't think that's in there. Yeah, so I started cruising there. at 15. I remember what it was like being 15. I didn't start cruising till I was in my 40s. What's it like for a 15-year-old hormonal teenager dude on a cruise ship? Is that like is that like wild? Were there were there other people your age there? What, did you guys have the run of the place? What what what's that like? Yeah, so it's a little different, right? So I started with Princess, and you got a lot of people that allocate Princess with the older generation of a cruise line. Couldn't be further from the truth. When I was 15, I've met so many kids my age. We had kids club events and parties, and it, you've been on the Caribbean Princess, so you know they have that Skywalker's nightclub, which is yeah. one of my favorite little venues. But when I was a kid, they used to have like a kids night dance nightclub party up there and everything. So... I've met friends that I still talk to this day from that cruise when I was 15 years old. Uh, that's wild. So to, to have those lifelong friendships and to develop those friendships with people that from when I was 15 and still have those friendships now in my mid thirties, I call that a successful win in my book. Right. I mean, uh, absolutely. You're, you're there for seven days. Like I, I got, I was lucky. I started off on a seven day voyage to the Caribbean. I lived in New Jersey at the time. So the Caribbean was something new for me. It was never something that was ever on my radar. But the friendships that came out of that seven-day cruise, I still talk to some of those people today. So, I, you know, 15 years old, you're off doing your own thing, man. And that's what I try and do with my kids. Go and explore. Have fun. You, you can't get lost. 
You're on yeah, the same ship. You're not going to get that, lost. That's the nice thing. Yeah, the the odds are pretty good that you're you know, you're not going to get off the cruise ship without somebody knowing it. Uh, what do you think? You know, and this will be pretty subjective, but you, you think the cruise ships are more safe, less safe, just the same as it was 15 years ago or 19 years I ago think, when you first started? For kids, anyways. I think they're more safe. Because I can, I can tell you some stories, Tony, from when I was a kid on things we, we did on the cruise ships, man. I think they're give more me one safe cra- now. Give me one crazy story. One crazy story from when you were a kid. Uh, I, you, ever, you always get them people talking about kids banging on the doors and all that stuff. We did that. We ran the hallways till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. There's curfews in effect now that weren't in, in place when I was 15 on a cruise ship. You just show back up to your cabin and your dad would ask you, what did you do all night? And, you know, you tell a little white lie to not get in trouble, but... Now you have the curfews that are in effect, which I think is a great thing. You have a lot more security around and present on the ships now than you had before. So I think they've come a long way with the security with the kids and the issues caused by some kids. But I try and tell everybody, man, you were a kid at one point in time in life. You know, let a kid be a kid and just enjoy themselves. Yeah. I tell you what, the the kids running up and down the hall, as I maybe yeah, I'm I'm definitely turning into a hey, get off my lawn kind of thing. (laughs) <laughs> I don't like it. I, I don't like it for sure. Oh, but, trust me. Okay, there's, so, there's times I don't, I don't, I don't get with it either. But then I just remind myself, like, all right, man, they're kids. You know, you were a kid at one it, point in time. Are you good at that? So, like, at three in the morning, if you, you know, had no sleep, and there's some kid running up the hall, are you just like, oh, you know, they're, they're just kids? Or are you like going, man, nah, if I could get a hold nah, of? Nah, three in the morning, I'm trying to find my way back to the room from the casino. But <laughs> that's true. That's true. You are you are a night owl when it comes but no, to cruising. I'm not saying it's all right for kids to run amok, man. I'm just saying, you know, just remember I there's more okay important for things in life for us to stress about than... You know what's more important than, than kids, running, than kids amok? running amok in the hallway? If anybody's wearing a hat in the main dining room, right? That's what we need to be oh, stressed yeah, that's, out Oh, yeah, that's about. a big one, man. Yeah. So 19, <laughs> 19 years of cruising. Let's talk about even that. When you first started cruising... Was every night in the main dining room were people somewhat dressed in their Sunday best, or w- w- when did this shift to it being okay to be casual except on formal night start to happen? So when I started cruising, it wasn't no somewhat Sunday best every night. It was every night. I remember my dad and us wearing three piece suits on a regular night, and on formal night, it was black tie. Like everyone had tuxedos. When I started oh, wow. cruising, Princess used to have a tuxedo rental shop on board their ships. So you'd be able to go to the tower and get fitted for a rental tux for your cruise. America, not was it America's best or men's warehouse. One of them. Yeah. America's best is the glasses company, but men's warehouse used to be able to go and rent a tuxedo. And I remember when I was a kid, we'd have to go and rent and rent a tuxedo for the cruise for dinners for all that. But then it got to a point to where my dad said, it's less expensive to just buy our own so we went and we had our own tuxedos for whenever we went and cruised. And casual nights were more of like you're just polo with khakis or khakis with a nice button up and a tie. And formal night was, that was it. You were formal. Men were in black tie. Women were in gowns. It was normal back then. I would say yeah. probably in the early 2010, 2012 area is when I started seeing more of a shift into the laid back, relaxed style of dining. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Even uh, in 2018, when I went on Royal Caribbean's Oasis of the Seas for the first time, they still had a spot on board that you could rent tuxedo. So I do think that that's something that's phased out slowly. I know like Norwegian Cruise Lines always kind of touted, at least as long as I've known cruising, that you know you can kind of come casual, that kind of thing. I don't know right. if those kind of things changed it up. but That's the thing. Like Norwegian's got that you know, free at sea or whatever it is. So you dine however you want, whenever you want type thing. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think for, you know, some, for formal nights, I think it, it, to show up formal, <laughs> yeah. it's formal night for a reason, right? Like I'm not, I'm not so, a big stickler, but I'm not going to show up in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt to formal night dinner. I'm going to at least have slacks and a button up shirt on. Yeah. So <clears throat> your grandparents definitely cruised in a different generation of cruising how do you feel like they would think about what, what do you think they would think about cruising now? We, we do get some pushback from kind of a generation before us. Do you, do you think they would like the things that have changed in cruising or, or do you think they would so push back on some of the things? It's funny you that's... ask that because my grandma and my grand, well, last year before my grandfather passed away, they were on a cruise in September and they were on a carnival cruise. My parents are with them. 
my grandmom's all for the change. She's all for the laid back, casual lifestyle. Now she's lived her life. She just wants to go relax and enjoy herself. My grandfather hated it. And he, <laughs> my grandfather was the type of person that woke up the same time every day, did the same thing every morning at the same time every morning. So he was so cyclical in his day that it, his routine carry over into him cruising. And he hated that you didn't have to wear a shirt and tie to dinner, that you didn't have to wear a, a, a blazer or a dinner jacket. And he would just be like, I don't understand what's going on with this world. I'm like, pop, it's a new world, man. You know, you, you're from a different time. You got to, you want to keep cruising. You got to roll with the changes or, you know, you just accept it or don't. But until his last cruise, Tony, he would always say, I don't understand how people can show up in a buffet wearing a bathing suit, this, that, <laughs> and I don't know, man, they just do. <clears throat> yeah. It's, uh, sorry for the loss of your grandfather, but man, it sounds like such a great uh, man, it's, it's, uh, you know, experience. It's, it's part of life, right? Yeah. We, uh, we all know, we all know eventually that that time is going to come. Um, yeah. And, and fortunately I got the live down here with them for the last five years. So I got to spend more time with them than uh, if I was living up North. So that's pretty awesome. So yeah, we're, I don't know. Everybody probably didn't know this, but we're neighbors. I mean, we live fairly close to each other. We live in the same town. Uh, you're from New Jersey. What brought you down here to Florida? Was it to be near your grandparents or I came um, here for my cruising and my in-laws, you know? Yeah. My grandparents broke ground here in 2004 they officially like built their house down here in 2004 so we used to come down and visit every year but i'd always felt like i had to be near the ocean so in the summertime up back home i would always be down the shore every weekend or i'd be on a boat fishing or whatever and i started getting into the mindset of cruising and the more cruising i did the more i came to florida the more i wanted to be in florida so i'd come and i'd spend a week and then i'd get on the cruise ship or i'd get on the cruise ship and then stay a week after i got tired of the snow now mm. not a lot of people know this but i worked for a subcontractor of the post office driving a truck and when i lived up north i was doing the same thing but i was driving from philadelphia to milford connecticut every day i was going through the heart of new york through the cross bronx expressway up past staten island and I got so tired of the traffic and then the snow and then the truck, you'd go to start it in the morning. It wouldn't start because of the cold temperatures. I came home one day and I was like, that's it. You're either coming with me or you're not. But in two weeks, I'm moving to Florida. I've already put my notice in. I reached out to a buddy down here who had a real estate you tell that to? You told that to your wife or who would you tell that to? Everybody. Everybody. You just showed up. Anybody who lives with me, home one day, to Florida. I came home from that one day from work, Tony, and my exact words were, I don't know about you, but I'm moving to Florida in two weeks. I reached out to a buddy of mine. He had a house for rent. I paid him what he needed for the house. Two weeks later, I had two U-Hauls at my, my condo up in New Jersey, packed them up and drove them on down. And I've been down the, here the ever wife, since. And then the, the pandemic kids hit. Came with so you, it, was, right? it was fitting. The wife and kids came with me. Um, so I have three kids, um, one through a first marriage who... Uh, we stayed up in New Jersey with his mom for a little while, and then he eventually moved down here with me. So he's down here with me now, and then my other two are here. Nice, nice. And what what year did you move to Florida? Uh, twenty nine in the beginning of twenty nineteen. So right before okay. the pandemic. So I moved down in February of twenty nineteen. Okay, so you beat us down here by, I guess we moved in in a January. So about yeah, like ten months, something like that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we've been in Florida around the same time as full timers in Florida. Do you, do you buy into this that we can't handle the cold anymore? Because, look, it's been, like, low 50s for the last three weeks here, and I have felt cold every day. And I grew up in the Midwest. I used to run around in shorts in the snow. I mean, I'm still wearing shorts every day, but I actually feel cold. Do you think something's happened to us physiologically because we've moved to Florida when it comes to cold? I want to say no, but I'm 100% I'm going to agree that it is because I was the same way, right? So – I would come down and visit my grandparents and they had a pool and in December we'd be in the pool swimming. Now December here, you ain't gonna catch me in the pool down here no, in Florida. Pool. It's not gonna happen. Pool's cold. But I still there's some days where I'll be like, okay, it's not that bad. And then as the sun starts to set, it gets worse. So yeah. I'll go to work in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, and by the time I'm done work, I'm like, Yeah, I should have wore pants. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. But they say so, your blood gets thinner, you know? So 
I, I know. I don't know if that's true. If anybody is out there that actually knows about blood, is that true? Because everybody tells me that. I don't even know if that's. I don't know if that's true or not. So thirty something cruises at this point. Have most of them been, you know, from Florida to the Caribbean? Where Where have you been around the world? So majority of the cruises I've been on have been from Florida to the Caribbean. I have a few that have not been from Florida. Um, so. The ones that haven't been from Florida, I did the transatlantic inaugural sailing on the Carnival Celebration um, out of Southampton. That was a cool trip. That was the first time I've ever done Europe. And then this past April, I did the transatlantic on the Pride over to Barcelona um, out of Tampa. So that was another another TA. And then I did Alaska in July on the Carnival Luminosa. What did you think about being on the Carnival Luminosa? Is that that one's completely rebranded Carnival? That's not that's not Carnival fun Italian style, right? How, how was that cruise? It wasn't bad. There was a lot of dead spaces that I think they could um, do better with. The one thing that I didn't like with it when they re did the rebrand process, they just called the taco place tacos and burritos and the burger place called off the grill. So there's no guy, there's no guys burgers. There's no blue iguana. Now, is that a be all end all? No, but for your devoted carnival cruiser that loves guys burgers, that's a little bit of an issue. Now, other than that, the venues were good. The decor, I believe, was excellent because they left most of the decor from Europe. So you still have that European style decor. It's a spirit class ship. Who doesn't love the spirit class ships? You know, them big old atriums and all that stuff. So it's it still has those like it still ticks those boxes for the average carnival cruiser. It just misses certain things. I loved all the seating, like your video you did the other day, fluffy cruiser seating. I'm I'm a fluffy cruiser, so the open seating, the the no arm rails on the chairs is a big thing I look for, and they had a lot of that there. Would I go on it again? Yeah, I would. I ha actually have it planned for next year. So. <laughs> is it a return trip to Alaska, or is it going to be somewhere else? So it's uh, a Trans Pacific out of Melbourne. Ooh. So it goes to Japan, uh, Australia, and all, uh, no, it leaves out of Australia, goes to Japan and Alaska and repositions up to Seattle. Wow. That sounds like that'd be a great cruise. So as somebody who went to the Caribbean a whole lot before you went to the West Coast and went to Alaska for the first time, what were some of the takeaways for you from Alaska? Well, what were your expectations going in and did they meet those expectations, fail those expectations? What were your what were your Alaska thoughts? It was definitely different, right? So I never planned on ever doing an Alaska cruise. I'm from a cold climate. I never wanted to go anywhere cold. Anytime I wanted to go on vacation, it was always a hot climate atmosphere that I wanted. So when I did Alaska, I was completely blown away, like from the sights and the sounds and just being somewhere where the sunlight was out a lot longer than it should ever be anywhere in the world. It was the little things that fascinated me more. So being able to go to Seattle, my first time ever going over to the West Coast, getting to walk around Pike Place Market and the streets of Seattle and seeing such a good like hippie vibe, I consider myself to be an old soul. So all the music I listened to is from the late sixties and seventies. So being able to walk around that hippie vibe and all that stuff really stuck out with me. But Alaska itself was a destination. I was not ever planning on going to. And once I did it, I was like, yeah, I got to do this every year. What were some of the highlights of the trip? Like what comes to mind immediately when you think of that trip to Alaska? The first thing that comes to mind is eating dinner at the steakhouse and then looking out the window and seeing the wows just pop up all over the place. Like really? we're just cruising the fjords on our way back. And all of a sudden you just see everybody just get up and rush towards the windows and everyone rushes outside over the railings because you had these pods of orca wows just popping up everywhere. Uh. It was that, awesome, I mean, man. I, I didn't think I would like Alaska either until I went and had some of those kind of experiences. Yeah. It's a it's a place. Are, are you going to try to go back to Alaska? Is that a place you oh, want yeah. to visit again? Or oh, yeah. are you? That's, is there any? What are some other places that are on your bucket list? Uh, and are you reluctant to get, go to any place, but you feel like maybe you should? No, I, I don't think I'm re reluctant reluctant to go anywhere. Um, Alaska is definitely on the list. It's it's a place I want to hit every year, and it's definitely a place I want to take the kids because. My kids are still young, so they don't never really got to experience that colder atmosphere or that, you know, 
wildlife type of adventure. So Alaska is definitely on the list to be able to take them to. Bucket list trips are obviously Japan, anywhere over in Asia. I absolutely love it over there. So Vietnam, Thailand, Japan, that's definitely on the list. Greece is on the list. Italy's on the list. And uh, I'll be actually hitting them in April of this year. So I'm super, super stoked about that. I don't think there's anywhere that I'm reluctant to go to. I, I want to go everywhere I possibly can. I want to see everything. I believe that travel is one of the best forms of education possible. You don't really understand other cultures and other religions and other mindsets until you actually indulge yourself in them. You can read a book all day long, but it's not going to give you that that real aspect and effect of it. So the one place I really want to go is I want to go to the Holy Land. That's definitely a, a place on my list. Unfortunately, with everything going on there now, it's not something that's doable at the moment, but uh, that's definitely a place to go. I think if I go and if I say anywhere, I'd be reluctant. It'd probably be like Antarctica, but it, it's on the list. It's just probably like yeah, one yeah. of those ones where I'm like, all right, this might be a place I don't make it out of. So <laughs> let's uh, save yeah, this yeah. one for later. Those are some great locations. I know you got to spend some time over in the UK this past year, and you got to. You were you in Barcelona this past year also, or just uh, over there in Southampton? Yeah, no, I was over in Barcelona in April. So what do you think of those two cities? Those are two iconic cities in Europe. Uh, of course, London, Southampton. And then Barcelona, how, how different did that feel to you going there for the first time as being somebody from the States? It's completely different feeling, right? So like, say London. So when I did that transatlantic on the celebration, I went and I flew in three days prior. I spent two days in London and a day in Southampton. The vibe alone is completely different. The food is so much better the, the quality of food is so much better over there, whether it be in Spain, London, or Southampton. I ordered fish and chips in Southampton right down the street from the, the cruise port, and it came out with like a five-pound filet <laughs> and like eight potatoes. And I'm like, this is insane. And it only cost me like 12 pounds. It was insane the amount, not just quality, but quantity and the quality of the food that you get over there and i'm a big foodie right so a lot of my stuff's about the food or on the ship or the food in the port you got my heart man and in barcelona when i can go and get a ham and cheese toasty with an espresso for for three euro and the quality be like subpar to what we got here it's insane it's absolutely yeah. insane. Yeah, the food definitely definitely hits different. I mean, the, you know, the great thing about the U.S. is there's so many different places with so many different types of cuisine. But then, it, you know, it's a whole it's a whole shift in cuisine when you go overseas. And you know, I don't know if part of it's just the newness, us experiencing something new, and that's why it seems so much better. But it's, um, yeah, the the food was definitely something to behold in yeah, Europe. I mean, it's like with so like I've done a lot of travel to Puerto Rico since my family's from there. But my what my grandmom can cook here, Spanish food wise, versus what I can get over there. It just tastes different. The quality is different. The food itself is different. Now, I love my grandma's cooking. So if she sees this, I'm not saying I don't love <laughs> your cooking. I'm just saying over there, the mofongo you can get in Puerto Rico is way better than any mofongo you can get here in the States. Uh, mofongo in Puerto Rico. That's a that's a great food memory that that I have. Um, yeah, I, I think we're going to be on one of those transatlantics together. Are we going to be on two transatlantics? Or no, you're not doing you're not going. Are you going from Florida to Barcelona, or are you just doing the Barcelona back? So I'm doing the Barcelona back. So I'm flying out at the beginning of April over to Rome, and I'm getting on the the brand new Sun Princess. I'm doing nine nights around the Mediterranean. So I'm hitting Italy mm -hmm. and Greece. And then I'm flying from Rome over to Barcelona the day before the transatlantic on the glory. Oh, nice. Yeah, we'll be doing the transatlantic back. I'm looking forward to that. You just came off the Carnival Jubilee, and you were on the second sailing of the Carnival Jubilee, the like with paying passengers? Yep, the second paying passenger sailing over New Year's. All right, I'm going to take a different tact on this. I've been on the Carnival Mardi Gras. I've been on the Carnival Celebration. Is, is the Jubilee just... Just more of the same. Like, is it, does it matter? What 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 did what did you think about the jubilee? Yes, it matters, and no, it's not the same. So, there are certain aspects of the ship that are going to feel the same, whether you've been on the Mardi Gras or the celebration, right? There's other aspects of the ship where you're going to be like, okay, this is the same, but it's different. So. On the celebration, you have that whole section where they do the latitudes, right? Where they change the windows and all of that. 
you have that here on the Jubilee, but it's now called Currents. And the bar that they have placed there with the art and the decor that they have with that bar, it's called Dr. Inks. My favorite bar on the whole ship. They have octopus coming out of the, the sides of the bar. It's an awesome venue. But they have this Currents, and I don't know if you remember or not, but remember last year I reached out to you little over a year ago, after I got off the celebration, I had this company message me asking if they can use one of my video clips on their website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because yeah. I, you know, demonstrated the, the system that they use. Well, that's the same company that developed the TVs and all of that interaction area through Currents. And on Deck 6 is where Currents is. And on Deck 7, outside the Alchemy Bar, they have this tablet where you can control the Currents yourself. So it's like this interactive feature that they put on the ship. I probably spent more time there than I should have. But I absolutely <laughs> love that section of the ship. Now, Emeralds is laid out a little different than it is on the other two venues. The seating's more of like a casual laid back seating. It doesn't feel like a upcharge restaurant. I did chef's table on this one. Absolutely phenomenal. I had an epic experience with the chef's table. And some things are the same, but some things aren't the same, right? So you walk through Celebration Station, it all feels the same. The seating, it all feels the same. The art is different. The decor is different. I don't feel bottlenecked in certain areas on that ship like I did on the Mardi Gras. And the same with the Celebration. I didn't feel bottlenecked in those areas that I felt bottlenecked on the Mardi Gras. It's not a deal breaker if you don't go on it and you've sailed the other XL class ships. I believe everyone that has done the other two should at least try it and go and enjoy themselves because there are, again, there are things that are different. It's going to look the same, right? So you, you look like it's cut, cookie cutter from the outside. In certain open areas, it's cookie cutter from the inside. But the venue, the vibe, it's just completely different, man. It's If I could have stayed on at a back-to-back, -back, which I was going to, I was literally getting ready to book the next voyage. And I was like, mm, no, I got to go home. I got to go home. I was going to stay on for another week. You're, you're so, getting ready to go on it, right? Yep. Uh, let's see. What is today? Today's the 15th. We leave, we fly out on the 19th, and we board the ship on the 20th. So, nice. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the trifecta also. I've been on the Mardi Gras, I've been on the Celebration. I'm going to go and see what the Jubilee is like, if it lives up to the hype. Let's talk about the hype around Jubilee. Let's talk about the hype around Galveston, Texas. Galveston, Texas has been the sweetheart of cruising, it seems like, since the return of cruising. And it was a big deal that Carnival put that big star on the front of the Jubilee. And now they've, you know, they've done some stuff inside the ship to make it feel like Texas. Did it live up to the Texas hype? Has Carnival done Texas justice in bringing the Jubilee to Galveston? I think they did. I think they did justice with bringing it to Galveston, right? So the cool thing about that with the Texas star is no, say Galveston disappears uh, as a cruise terminal, right? No matter where that ship goes, it's going to have the Texas star. It's inlaid steel on the front of that ship. It's not just painted there. That's inlaid steel. So that ship is going to have the Texas star on it until it's retirement. When you go inside the ship, a lot of the, the stuff that you can purchase as a guest in the gift shop, they have shirts that say howdy on it. You can get some cowboy hats. There's a lot of inaugural stuff, you know, just theme based around Texas. But what I think they learned with this ship is they tried some stuff with the Mardi Gras, they tweaked it with the Celebration, and they're finally hitting the nail on the head with the Jubilee. The Mardi Gras was brand new to Carnival, right? That was the first ship in the XL class. So that was the first time they've ever had a ship that large. They made some fine-tuned adjustments with it, with the Celebration, but now they've, they've nailed it completely perfect with the Jubilee. That's good. I'm excited to go on it. The, the only trepidation I have really is not necessarily with the Jubilee, but it's a little bit with the Port of Galveston. When I was there, I think it was 2018 or 2019, the embarkation and disembarkation was a little bit of a challenge and the infrastructure seemed a little challenged. So in my mind, now that there's even more going on in Galveston, I wonder what kind of improvements have been made. How was the disembarkation? How was the embarkation and disembarkation? So Embarkation wasn't too bad. Um, again, it was the second sailing I was on, so it was a little crowded. I know they put new air conditions in the, the building, so um, at least once you get inside, it's air conditioned. Um, and then they redid the the seating area, so that's nice. It's not mm. as bad or horror story effect that I've heard about it before. Debark, that was a little less congested as it was on Embarkation Day. So from start to finish of getting off the ship, I was off the ship within five minutes. I was off mm, the ship, good. picked up on my way to the airport, 
hotel within five minutes. So yeah, that's really good. Embarkation took a little bit longer than debark. Now we did take a shuttle. We stayed at the Harbor House, so we took the shuttle from Harbor House to the ship, which I don't recommend. Um, I sat in more traffic than it would have took me to walk there from the Harbor House. I would have been there within five minutes walking, but it took about twenty five minutes on the shuttle. And then once you got off the shuttle, you know, it took about twenty minutes to get through, get checked in. And then into the seating area. So it wasn't rel- relatively wasn't too bad. I think their issue more so was the the letter, like the system they have for getting on the ship. They have this letter system. And depending on your priority stat or your platinum, your, your status with the cruise line, or if you booked faster to the fun, depends on the letter you get. Well, I got T and I'm platinum status and had priority and I was letter T. So even though I had priority boarding status, I still had to wait until they got from A all the way to T before I could even get in line to get on the ship. So, I mean, two, 3,000 people already got on the ship prior to me even getting on. So that's – pack your patience a little bit with that. Um, but all in all, it wasn't too bad. So what, what kind of cabin did you have on the Jubilee? So I had a balcony cabin, just a regular what, basic balcony, 14 forward. You find, them any, you find that cabin any different on the Jubilee than on the Celebration or the Mardi Gras, or is it essentially the uh, same? No. They're essentially the same. I hate them either way. It doesn't matter what same, ship it's on. Same small, same small <laughs> same bathroom. Same small cabin. Yeah. It's, same, it, it's tough, right? So I think I've been on 14 Carnival Cruises, and few, quite a few of them have been on the XL class, but I've done quite a few of them on the Luminosa and the Pride and the Paradise and the Liberty. We're talking smaller ships that have had bigger cabins, right? So you know that. With the name of the game in in the corporate world, it's as many people as we can get on the ship and as many cabins as we can make. But it takes away a little bit from the experience because you're making the guests feel like you're paying more, but you're getting less type thing. So I can go on a an older ship that's just as beautiful, does the same thing, maybe not 100% the same thing, but I get a cabin that's twice the size. Um, I don't know, you know, it, and it's tough, right? So... Again, being a fluffy traveler, I got to turn sideways to walk through the foot of the bed to to the balcony. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a fluffy traveler or not, because I've talked to people that were sm- way smaller than me, and they still got to turn sideways to get past the TV. I was thinking by the end of the cruise, I was going to owe Carnival a TV for that wall because I kept bumping <laughs> into, into it. So. Yeah. That, that's a wild thing. You, like You said something out loud that I thought in my mind earlier today that I wanted to go look up. I, I do believe that the cabins on the older ships are bigger than the cabins on the newer ships, which is I I, I don't love that. I, I understand it like you. I understand it, but I don't I don't love that. So yeah, that's one of the things as we've anticipated going on the Jubilee. It's like oh here we go another week in this tight cabin. It, you know it, it, yeah, there's worse things in the world to be stressed out about, but yeah it. You just wish for a happy medium sometimes where you could go on a nice brand new ship and have a lot of space in your cabin. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't work out. So let's let's just wrap up the Jubilee talk with that conversation. Mardi Gras celebration, Jubilee, the XL class. I asked this question to a lot of people. Does it still feel like Carnival to you or is it so different than the previous ships that it doesn't? Is is it uh, is, is Carnival evolved into something, you know, next level or have they done something completely different with this XL class that maybe doesn't feel like Carnival? No, I think they evolved to the next level, right? I think they up their game a little bit more. I don't think it feels any less than Carnival. I still have the great times at the piano bar. I still have an awesome cruise director. Food venues are always epic. I think what they did is they up their game to the next level on their chessboard. So in a game of chess, the goal is to always level up. And I think that's what Carnival is currently doing with their their process of shipbuilding. So no matter what, right, they're gonna they're gonna go back and they're gonna build a Vista class, they're gonna build a spirit class, they're gonna build a fantasy class ship because they sell out of numerous ports that require the smaller size ships. I think Carnival dabbled in the larger ship market and they are finally, like I said, nailing it down to where they know it works for them. You look in the princess, right? A lot of princess ships None of them have water slides. None of them have a ropes course or anything like that. Well, the new Sun Princess that's coming out in February has that because now they know, okay, well, this is working with our sister line for more family friendly. Let's do something like that here. 
and give that family friendly feel over here on Princess that we have not for so many years and we're not known to have that ropes course or that, you know, fly around zip line type thing. So I think they're dabbling in that and they know that's going to be beneficial for them. And Carnival did the same thing, right? So the bigger the ship, the more you can fit on it in that type of aspect. But I don't want to see Carnival go as big as Royal with the Oasis class or the Icon class. I think that would ruin Carnival for what they are. I don't think there would be as much, um, not necessarily like one-on-one time with your crew members as you would get, but I think it would take away from the Carnival experience more if they went any bigger than they did. But I think Carnival is doing it right. They're they're putting more venues there. I'm I'm a big fan of like multi-venued areas. So like that center stage, yeah, I love that. I'd rather have that than the old style atriums. I'd rather be able to watch a show or a game show and then a a theater production here or whatever or what they call Viva Variety. I'd rather be able to have that than just that old style atrium. I think that's way better than the atrium. I like how they put the Havana Club where they put it and you can go and listen to salsa and all that there. So the bigger the ship, the more venue spaces you have. But Carnival is doing it in a different realm than Royal. I think Icon, you have how many buffets on Icon? Like, that's just... It's a lot. <laughs> you, I, I'm telling everybody, it's like, are you going on it? I'm like, eventually I'm going to go on it, but I'm going to need like five back-to-back seven-day cruises to see the whole shit. Yeah. I've seen I've seen some video from Royal Caribbean blog where he was able to go around the Icon it's really – it's a beautiful ship, but it is so massive. I think you're, I, there's no way you can experience it all in a week. It's going to be interesting, and then they just cut steel on their third Icon-class ship. So these big ships are going to be in our face. But you know, the thing that you were saying about these multi-use venues, I do like that trend in cruising because you think about it sometimes on some of these older ships, the main theater just sits basically unused for unused you know 12 – 12 hours a day, and that's a lot of real estate that they could be using somewhere else. So I'm kind of glad that we've started to see a little more push into multi-use space. Um, so let's uh, strip away all the cruise line sp- specifics. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you like to do when you go on a cruise? What is your cruising profile? So I like to eat. Um, you can't still. No, I love, I'm a big <laughs> foodie, man. I love trying all different types of food. Um, I'm a big piano bar guy. I love listening to the piano bar player. Uh, my favorite musician's Billy Joel. So, uh, anytime I can go listen to a guy bang, bang some keys and sing some tunes, I'm always there. Comedy shows are some of my favorites. Uh, love and marriage is one of my favorite shows to go watch. Uh, I like to spend a little bit of time in the casino. That's one of my, uh, that's one of my biggest things with the cruise. I don't, I don't really spend time in the casino on land. So when I'm on a sh- on a ship, that's pretty much where you can find me. You can either find me at a food venue or in the casino. Yeah. So I know you as as somebody that's a, a little bit of a legend when it comes to testing the fates, and I know that you get a lot of cruises for free. And uh, yeah, I don't want you to have to give away all of your secrets, but. I don't know. Can you kind of outline a strategy? Like if there's a person out there, the question I always have, so maybe we can get there at the end of the discussion is, you know, are, do you feel like you're able to gamble and get free cruises and that be less money than what you would just outright pay for cruises? And 100%. How, how, do you, how, how do you get, so how, how does that work out? What, what What's the strategy if it's not giving away too much, too many of your secrets? So, I give myself a bank balance, right? So every day I give myself, I allot myself how much I can lose in the casino. So say I go on a seven day cruise and I give myself a $500 a day allowance. If I lose that $500, then I'm done for that day. Now, if I'm up, I take that $500. I put that in my player's bank and I play with the house's money because I'm still, I'm even. I got my $500 right here. I'm not losing anything. I'm just playing with house money now. I get a lot of people that ask me all the time, how much money do I need to bring on a cruise to gamble to get free offers? And I'm going to tell you right now, there's no set number. It's the amount of time you spend in the seat, and it's the amount of times you either push a button or you place a bet. It's got nothing to do with the amount that you spend, right? So I got a buddy, Cameron, who on the Pride with me in April, he brought $400. He played through his $400, but he walked out with his $400. He's getting offers now for 50% off or $25 cabins, $100 transatlantics. He's not getting extra perks with it, but he's getting the perk of the cruise being that steeply discounted. 
I got another cruiser that goes with me and spends a thousand dollars and gets free drinks, free free play, onboard credit, and a free cab. So I tell people when they ask me like, how much money do I need for a seven day cruise? I tell them bring a thousand dollars, bring a thousand dollars. That's so, a lot of money. Then bring you're what you're comfortable with losing. Yeah, and so you're primarily playing the slot machine. So I guess what I'm gathering from what you're saying is I could go mm -hmm. in with my $500 a day. That's $3,500 for a seven-day cruise. And if I just blow through that by making, say I make 35 $100 bets, and I'm only in the casino for a couple hours, then my life, then I may not, may not get a free offer off of $3,500. So it's, it's time in the seat. So is there a strategy for like, I'm only going to pay the minimum bet or how, how do you, how do you get that time in the seat without losing everything you brought? Well, it's, it's based off the points and the time in the seat, right? So obviously if you're betting more, your point value per spin is going to be more. Mm. So if they see you betting a hundred dollars a spin, the amount you're going to make on the points of that spin is way more than what you would make on an 88 cent bet, right? Mm -hmm. So I I like to stick at a five dollar bet bet whether it's minimum, maximum, whatever it is. I like to stick around that five dollar number. Okay, five dollars a spin. I'm happy with that. I'm comfortable with wagering five dollars a spin, no matter what table game I'm playing at. It's ten dollars minimal. It's going to cost me ten dollars to buy in. So. I can get two chances at my 10 bucks at a $5 slot machine versus one chance at a table game with my 10 bucks. And that's not including side bets, right? So that's not including those sucker bets or anything like that. That's just my straight buy-ins, $10. So I'm happy at that $5 denomination. I'll fluctuate every now and then. I'll go up $1.50. I'll go down $1.50. I'll change my denomination. But my, my strategy, Tony, is I put the machine, the money in the machine. I hit the denomination to a dollar. I hit 50 cents, that's my $5 bet, and I just play. I don't always win. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, I definitely want to get into to, to the wins and losses, because I, I think you, I know you have some stories of some big wins, and if you want to share any big losses, but do you do any uh, interaction with the casino staff? Like, are you are you actively, like, trying to seek out the casino host on day one? Do you check in with them yeah, throughout so the week? Do you somehow let them know that you're trying to get free cruises? I tell everybody to, to go talk to the casino host, right? If you're on a non-casino offer, go talk to the casino host. And here's a tip for Carnival. Not a lot of people know this. If you're a platinum or up, you get $25 in free play. So go load it to your card and just have fun with the 25 bucks. I mean, it's there. It's part of the perk, right? So use it. Um, I, I don't typically go and see the casino host on the first night, depending on how crowded the casino is. I'll go and I'll just ask the casino host, like, hey, is this an offer cruise? Meaning, like, an elite offer or an ultra offer. Is there a lot of casino players that were, you know, brought on this cruise specifically? So, like, your Halloween cruise that you were on was a big casino cruise. So, right. it was hard, probably hard to find a seat most nights in the casino. So I'll go and I'll ask the casino host, like, hey, is this an offer cruise? Do we have a lot of, like, high limit players on here? What's the what's the realm looking like? Because Carnival does really good with it. They'll come and they'll talk to you depending on the, the amount of points that you have. So anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000 points, they're going to come offer you something. I've had Steakhouse offered to me. I've had Steakhouse selections in the main dining room offered. I've had Rudy's offered to me. This last cruise, I was offered spa treatments and all that stuff. So it pays to talk to the casino host, but it also, you you can't just expect them to get you something by talking to them. You have to show like points or whatever. You have to be actively pay, playing for them to be able to get you something. Um, and it depends, right? So like every, every ship's different, every week's different. You can have a thousand casino guests on that cruise, or you can have 200 casino guests on that cruise. I think the ones that have the least casino guests are the better. So like that transatlantic, here's a perfect example. The transatlantic we're going on in April on the glory. That's an elite offer for me. So I know if I got an elite offer for that cruise, there's a lot of other people that are going to be on that mm -hmm. cruise through a casino offer. And depending on, you know, again, depending on what you play, and with Carnival, it started with me after my first Carnival cruise. So the first time I cruised on Carnival was the Lolita Loca Halloween group cruise on the Mardi Gras back in 21, right after the restart. I mm. got a free cabin offer at the end of that cruise because I hit that hand pay. After that, every time I've played, I've 
just constantly have continued to get offers. They've just rolled over or they've sent me uh, special offers that have to be booked within like 72 hours or something like that. I've had some good wins. I've had some bad wins. But I mean, you know, the, the wins always outweigh the losses. And that's a good thing. So I'm technically still up no matter how you look at it. So, so let me ask, because I'm, I'm someone who gambles, and I know my own personality. Like, if you ask me how I'm doing, I'll always say I'm about even. And I don't know that I always do great record keeping on it. When you say that you know that you've got more wins than losses, is that a for real? Like, you've 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 tallied the books on it, that's, or is that just a feel thing? No, that's that's for real. I'm with the amounts that I've won versus what my folios have said, I know I got more wins than All losses. Right, good, good. That's good. Cause I, I'm I'm not mature enough yet to live in that world. I don't I don't look at my folio. I just I, I think I'm about even. I'm pretty sure yeah. I did okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now most of the time I'm I am even, man. If there's a time I'm down I, the one thing I hate the most, right, and I tell a lot of people, don't chase don't chase the win. Just don't chase it. After a while, get up and leave. You keep feeding that machine. That machine's going to just keep taking your money. Stop chasing it. It's <laughs> there's Tomorrow's another day. Come back. Yeah. And I've, I've been guilty myself. I've sat at a machine that took 500 bucks, and I turn around and put $500 in, and I'm like, it's, it's bound to hit. After that, I'm like, yeah, man, you just stuck $1,000 in the machine for no reason, bro. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Do you have a favorite casino that you've gambled in on a cruise ship? Do you like Princess or Carnival or Norwegian um, better? Or? I like Carnival more. I've won the most across Carnival. Mm. And Princess, I've won some some pretty good payouts with Princess. But I know that Sun Princess is going to have that extremely large casino. So that's uh, that's nine days in Europe. I'm going to get to experience that casino, which I have to like. I have to can like look into right. So a lot of the cruises that I've done and had wins on have been out of the U.S. or to the U.S. Now, how does that work over with Europe? If I hit a hand pay in Europe, is that taxable? Since I'm an yeah, American I, I, citizen, probably, right? Yeah, I think all of the casino stuff is still considered to be connected to the U.S. So I think you're going to get a tax form if you hit a hand pay, even even if you're in the med. That I, I even experienced that when I was in Australia. Like all of the casinos operated in uh, USD. One US dollar. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that's true across the board. That's some princess. I'm looking forward to it. I, I I'm fortunate. I get to go on one of the early sailings or the yeah. uh, maybe the inaugural, the inaugural sailing. Inaugural. So yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to seeing how they do this new cruise ship. Let, let's transition a little bit. And so uh, you know, you are a YouTube content creator. Your YouTube channel is the Naughty Cruiser. What what can people expect when they follow you on YouTube? What's what's your what are you putting out there for people to pick up? You can watch me eat food. No, I'm just kidding. So I, I'm a fluffy, friendly <laughs> traveler. I'm a foodie at heart. I love all forms of travel. It's not just cruising. My channel is all about cruising. It's about getting to the cruise ship, experiencing the cruise ship, the embarkation process, the destinations itself. Um, and I just love being able to bring that to people, right? So like, my passion is to show you what I get to see. And I know it's not the same through the lens of a camera other than through your own eyes. But there's a lot of people out there that want to know the new new. They want to know about the Jubilee or they want to know about the Sun Princess. And I like being able to be that person that brings that to you. So you get to see a lot of frugal friendly travel. You get to see a lot of foodie travel. Um, I'm always finding that back alleyway, you know, guy cooking barbecue right down the back alleyway somewhere in Bimini. Um, that's me. That's that's all, what I'm all about. I'm family friendly. Uh, I got three little kids, so a lot of the times you'll see them with me on the cruise ship or in a vlog. Well, you do a great job at it. I've seen a lot of those videos, and sure. I feel like I'm there. And I really do appreciate you sharing your journeys. You go to some unique places that you know I've never been to, and others haven't been to. And so I appreciate you putting yourself out there. And anybody listening or watching, uh, make sure you go check out Mike at the Naughty Cruiser on YouTube. You'll find all of his other links and stuff around that way, too. So, uh, Mike, yeah, there's so much more to talk about. I got a list to, that I could keep going on, but I don't want to keep you all night. We'll have to do this again. Thank you so much for taking your time and having the conversation. It, and uh, you give me a lot to think about. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to see if I can get me a, a free cruise on this Jubilee. I don't know. I've never gotten a free cruise from gambling. but uh, I've, I've gotten No, you've never before, got an offer? 
No, nah, it's it's weird as a table player. I don't. I I probably don't put in. You know, I'm a I'm a like yeah. a you hit it and quit it kind of guy, right? So I just want to go in. I got some strategies for making some quick money or losing money quick, and then I get out of there. So I mean, I, mean, I gotta maybe put some more. Listen, time man. In after what I took them for this last cruise, I was pretty sure they were gonna be like, "Hey, can you stay on next week and give some of that back? <laughs> <laughs> give some of it back. No, nope, got well, to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool, buddy. I sure do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. Man, that conversation was a good one. Did not disappoint. I think I'm even more jazzed than usual to do some gambling on my next cruise. That could be a good or a bad thing. Hey, show Mike some love. Go check out his YouTube channel, The Naughty Cruiser. A big thanks to Mike again for stopping by. Hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Just to let you know, there also is an audio version of the podcast. So if you like listening to the podcast in your car, you can find the Lily Loca Cruise podcast on any of the major podcasting platforms. If you've enjoyed this video, Video, please do me a solid hit that like button if you've never thought about it maybe subscribe to the youtube channel here a big thanks again for all you guys for listening this is tony for la lita loca and until the next time i'll see you on the lido bye